happy to see you all to tonight. If you have not received our little handy dandy handout, would love for you to grab one. Um, there's also writing utensils that Rebecca can give you if you need a writing utensil. We'll get to the handout in a little bit. Yes, I printed it wonky. My apologies. No, I was going to say something anyway because these things normally perturb me. Um, my computer is set up so that when my wife prints for Minnie's class, that it flips it in a way so that you can read it, like when she shows the pictures to the kids, and I didn't realize that. So just printed, and then I was like, well, they're done. Thank you for being forgiving. Um, so good evening. We are, for the next few weeks, um, we are going to be talking about reading our Bible and studying our Bible and what that looks like and how we can unpack that a little bit. Um, if you weren't here last week, I'm going to give a brief overview just to remind you. Um, it is on our YouTube page. Um, if you want that link, you can text into the church or email me, um, and I'd be happy to send that to you. I think that we're recognizing in our community very quickly that the season of reading our Bible is really imperative. And we're hoping that giving you some strange and wonderful tools um, will be a way for us. If you've struggled with reading the Bible or you're like, I try and then I give up, we're, we're looking to press in to figure out how to do this together in this season. And so last week, um, we talked a lot of things, but I want to just mention a few as we continue our journey tonight. Um, and the first thing I want to remind everyone is the Bible is words about the word. Um, that all of the words in the Bible are about Jesus. Um, we see this both in Luke 24 as well in John 5. Um, Jesus highlights that all the law and the prophets are about him. And then he also says that you're studying the scriptures, like trying to find eternal life, um, but these whole scriptures testify about me. And so it's really important that when we read the Bible, they're trying to tell us things about Jesus, whether we realize it or not, and that that is super important. So we talked about, like, what is the context of the Bible? And we're like, it's Jesus. Um, I've been talking to a friend of mine just about the Bible and about Jesus and just helping them see how it always goes back to him. It always goes back to what he's about. It always goes back to what he's doing. And so we want to make sure that we're doing that. And listen, that comes into some awkward places. <laughs> when you show up um, in, you know, the Psalms and you read things like, Lord, I want you to dash those babies' heads against the rock. And you're like, that's terrifying and violent. How does that go back to Jesus? How, how you know? And, um, and so, you know, I was talking to um, some high schoolers. I'm teaching a high school Bible class right now, which is already wonderful and terrifying, um, as you can imagine, like, what high schoolers are like. But I was reminding them that, you know, we read this passage where the psalmist is saying, you know, I just want to dash the baby's heads of my enemies against the rocks. And you read it, and you're like, that doesn't sound like Jesus. That doesn't sound like these things. But at the same time, if you're a human being, there are moments that you want to hit things. You want to throw things. You want to beat people up. You want to throw hands. You know, it's, you know, I always, I have one friend that she's like, I have one big fight left in me in my, in my lifetime. And I'm like, I don't want to be that person uh, around you in that moment. But it's, it's helping us realize that, you know, even in Jesus's perfect way, he still was human. And so, yes, maybe he wasn't dashing babies' heads, but the expression of it is saying, hey, we're human, and it's hard, and we're frustrated, and we're angry, and that's okay. Um, and we see Jesus masterfully talk um, through the Gospels about his frustration, and man, he calls people names. He's like, you whitewashed sepulchers, you know, you pit of vipers. There's a real humanity to that. 
And so it all does talk about Jesus in some way, shape, fashion, and form. It's just whether or not we can extract that and we can engage that. Um, the primary thing that we talked about last week, um, outside of me telling you some crazy stories about my life and about my whole life falling apart, and I found that the Bible brought my life back together um, in a way that nothing else had, um, in a really beautiful and powerful way. But we talked about an old reading style, studying the Bible called Lectio Divina. Um, it's been around for a long time, um, and it's, it's four steps, and I think that they're really beautiful. It's read the Bible, maybe a hundred times, whatever. Meditate on that section, meaning that you chew on it, you think about it, you process it, you engage it, you ask, like, what, how does it hit you? You pray those verses. And the last is you contemplate them to move yourself towards action. And that's really just the basics of what it looked like. And we were talking about how there's a lot of different ways you can read the Bible and study the Bible. I, I gave you, you all last week um, four different methodologies that come up in the medieval time period and pretty much have stayed as the four main ways people kind of look and interpret the Bible. And my biggest qualm with them is that they, none of them demand the livingness of reading the Bible like I feel like Lectio Divina does because it pushes you to the place of what am I going to do? And, um, and so it was a lot of fun to talk through it last night, or last week. And um, I've had a lot of people uh, just say, hey, I'm really glad we're doing this. And so we're like, okay, we're going to keep going. <laughs> so uh, I'll talk a little bit tonight, next week. Um, one of our amazing people on our leadership core, Cassie, is going to be teaching. And then Pastor Alvin will teach the last about reading the Bible. But I wanted to start tonight with 2 Timothy 3.16. And you might have heard it at some point mentioned um, in, in a church somewhere. But it says this, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So that a person of God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. And I wanted to start with this because... I think that it gives us a couple of really important things to think about as we come into the Bible. We're going to talk through those, and then I'm going to give you another pathway outside of the Lectio Divina pathway. We're going to give you another pathway that you can approach reading the Bible and studying the Bible, and then we're going to actually do it together, which hopefully you'll find to be a lot of fun. So in 2 Timothy 3, it says that all scripture, all the writings that have been compiled together are god breathed or are inspired. And what I love about this idea of being God-breathed is the idea that the Holy Spirit or the breath of God moved upon men and women to write these things down. And I think that for each one of us, it's just beautiful to remind ourselves that this book is not just any old ordinary book. It is a book that has been moved upon by the Spirit of God for our lives and for some major, major reasons. And I think this verse does a great job of explaining it. The first thing is it says that it is useful for teaching. And I was reading and studying it, and I think that when we come to the Bible, one of the biggest things we need to do is come open to learn. That when the Bible is teaching, we are the learner. We posture our heart in a place of learning. We posture ourselves in a sense of being open to receive the words of God. Um, I, w I was telling the students in the class on, on Monday that I was teaching that I'm like, hey, don't read the Bible like you already know what it's about. We do that. We read it like we assume that we know the story, we understand what's happening. And I really think that there's a great amount of humility that comes when we believe that all the Bible is for teaching. And that is not just for us to teach. It's for the Bible to teach us. If you go read this verse, it's saying it's inspired and useful for teaching so that the person of God will be worked in a good way. So it's not like, oh, I'm going to use the Bible to teach people. No, no, I'm going to use the Bible to be taught by to be receptive. It also says for reproof, a little bit of an old school word, 
but I wrote down that when I read the Bible, I need to be open to exposure. Yeah, right? That I come to the Bible and the Bible exposes me for who I am and for who I am not. And what a challenge that is, to come into that place where I recognize when I read the Bible, this is an old school word, but I think it's appropriate, you will find yourself being convicted by the word of God. I mean, the stories that I've heard of so many people, I was in fifth grade and these crazy people called the Gideons came into my school and they gave me this little New Testament and I read it and when I read it, I felt like I needed to change my life. (laughs) And I followed the little back flap that told me how to become a follower of Jesus. And now I'm a believer because of that. It's why people are like, oh, I've almost been on the verge of suicide. And I'm sitting in the hotel room and I open up the drawer and there's the Bible there. And like things happen because God convicts through the word of the Lord, through the Bible. It also says that it's for correction. And... I was like, you know, correction, what is this? And it's funny because the word literally means to straighten up again. Um, And so I wrote down that we needed to be open to realignment. Like maybe you've done something well in the past, but when we come to the Bible, it might be asking us, hey, maybe you need to do it again. Do it differently. And there's an alignment that happens, a realignment. And then the last thing it says is that it's for training in right living. And I really love this because this word means to put yourself into being a, uh, to being tutored by the word of God so that you might be able to be relationally right, both with God and with one another and with the world. And I think those are some big standards (laughs) when I think about it, to come to the Bible with that idea of like, wow, I'm going to learn, I'm going to be exposed. I'm going to be realigned, and then I'm going to maybe be ordered all over again. And that when that happens, I become a person of God. Like, do you notice that? Like, that it's so that the person of God, that there is a personage that comes on our lives when we read the Bible, that we don't always find in the world that we're in. The world, for the most part, does not encourage us to be persons, It encourages us to be a lot of other things, but very rarely persons. We are pictures online. You know, we are avatars. It's like all the rage. We love AI, which is not personage. And so the question is, is like how have we unintentionally become robotic in our existences? How many times do we become RoboCop and whatever we're doing And, you know, so I started this, like, joke with a friend of mine where I'm like, hey, no robots allowed. (laughs) Like, we're talking about something, and all of a sudden, he's like, e, 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 e. And I'm like, hey, hey, no robots allowed. Persons only. But I think it's beautiful because the Bible calls our roboticness out and shows us that that is not the way Jesus lives. He's not press the button and get the milk duds. It's not that robotic interaction with the Lord. Um, And it's not what the Lord wants from our lives either. And so I was encouraged that we could, you know, come to the place where we can be equipped for good works. And I think it's really awesome because the word here um, that's behind the text means that all parts work together when you're living in this way. That every single part of you begins to work together to be the person of God. And I think that's encouraging because... As I think about my life, as I assess my life, I think I notice that there's certain parts of me that are very committed to God. They love God, they're for God, and there's other parts that are just way more hesitant. But in reading the Bible, it's calling all of me to come back to him, to come back into personage, to stop being robots, to, you know, or worse, animals, <laughs> right? Listen, maybe you're like, oh, I don't resonate with that you know, robot language, maybe you're acting like an animal and you're living by your lizard brain, you know, and you're just out here following all the desires of your heart and eat, sleep, and mate, you know, that's like lizard brain. Or maybe you're so spiritual that you've decided not to be a person, you've decided to be an angel, you know, just untouchable, floating around, 
with eyes all over your body and crazy wings. I don't know. That's your decision, not mine. Um, you know, because the Bible does not describe angels the way art does. But I was encouraged to think about this because I think when I, when I read all of these things, the thing that resonated in my heart was I was like, the Bible is to be read for change. Like, that's why we're reading it, so that we would be changed so that we would be formed and fashioned and made into the people of God. So, um, I want to teach you another approach. We did Lectio last week. We're going to do another one. It doesn't have a cute name. It's just a five-step pro- process. If you want to call it Oigai, I guess we could do that if we just used all the first letters uh, of it. Um, and here are the five words. Number one is observation. Number two in this process is interpretation. Number three is generalization. Number four is application. And number five is implementation. I'm going to say them one more time. Interpretation, I mean, um, observation, interpretation, generalization, application, and implementation. And so what I thought that we would do, which I think could be really fun, is I gave you your handy-dandy sheet where we all have Genesis 1, the whole chapter, in the English Standard Translation in front of us. And so I, I want us to practice observation real quick together. Um, and so this is the question that I want you to ask concerning observation. What does it say? Okay. What does it say? And I want to give you a few little things to to possibly notice concerning observation. The first is, do you sense anything when you read the book or when you read the page of the scripture? Do you sense anything? Do you have any images that come to your mind as you're reading? Are you an imaginative person? Do you have any feelings that arise as you read it? Do you have any thoughts that show up? And then do you have any sense of I'm moved to do something or moved towards a behavior? So that's one, one part of the observation. Another part of the observation that I want to highlight is um, can we look for patterns, repetitions, phrases, words that hi- are highlighted or stick out to us? Can we see a form or a structure opening up in the passage, um, and then asking the question, what are the relationships of everything that's in the passage, okay? So what I'd like you to do is find a little group of two or three people, and I just want you to read um, from verse 1 to verse 8, okay? Verse 1 to verse 8. Actually, we'll go even, we'll even go a little earlier. Let's do 1 to, um, to 5. Yes, one to five. I'm sorry, one to five together, two or three groups, and I want you to ask the question, what does it say? And then I want you to reflect on senses, images, feelings, thoughts, feelings of behavior, repetitions, phrases, um, and, and let's just see what happens, okay? So just take a few minutes, like three minutes, read through it with your little mini group, and I want you to ask, what does those few verses, five verses, what do they say? Okay, ready, set, go.
Okay, I know that that wasn't long. <laughs> but I would love for someone, anyone from any group, tell me something that you observed. What does it say? Anything. You can raise your hand if that's helpful. What does it say? What's something you observed? Not everyone at once. Yes, sir. The spirit hovers. Okay. Cloudy. Okay. Spirit hovers. It's cloudy. Cool. Somebody else. What else did you observe? Cadence, cadence and rhythm of the words. Awesome. Someone else? Yes, sir. What I think the whole thing is light. Light. It says that there was light. And you can't perceive anything without light. That's right. That's where we fail with everything. Yeah. I like it. More like this. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's if it gives people a second chance. That's the only thing. So <laughs> Money you know, always asking like crazy theological questions <laughs> off of just a simple question of what does it say? <laughs> um, I I was like observing it, and I was again, guys. I'm doing the same thing. Okay, I promise. Like I have a crazy page. I already tried to do this once, and it's full of craziness. But I was reading it again, and I was like, oh, what's something like I observed? And I want you to, I want you to think about this, because this is kind of funny to me, that we get a sense that God saw something, right? How many of you in your brain went, oh, wow, God has eyes? God spoke something. God has lips. You see what I'm saying? Guys, I've never thought that. I've read this hundreds of times, probably thousands of times, and never once in my brain have I thought, huh, it says that God has a face. That's interesting. Well, we're not there yet, though. We don't know that yet. We don't know that. We're only on verse 5. We're only on verse 5, money. But, but then, okay, but like, let me, I'm just, I want to invite you into my crazy process because we can all do this. But I was like, well, if God has a face, that's very interesting because then God's face is over the face. Isn't that interesting? It, and it says that it's the face of the what? Waters. Ever looked at the water before? You see your face. Now, again, I'm just throwing this out there. I'm not saying that we're going to build a theology on God's face. I think we can. But I just thought that was really different, that I've never noticed that before. This is the first time it hit me. I was like, oh, this passage tells me. I'm observing. What does it say? That God has a face. Interesting. And there's so many other things, you know, that we could say. But I want us to now take the next step, Okay. Uh, maybe another observation. Somebody else. What was another observation then? Kessler, what did you guys have in your group? Yes, like day and evening and morning. Love that. I, should, I, I meant to like highlight all the things that people said. Because it was so cool to think about how many things you guys said. Face, face. Did I get them all? It's very attractive. Light. Like, oh, how about you guys? Thank you. Like yeah, I was like, it's in a weird place. I remember when I wrote it. <laughs> so, okay, so now the next question is interpretation, okay? 
Now listen, everybody can interpret. <laughs> okay, don't think that only nerdy Bible people like me can interpret. I want you to ask the question, what does it mean? Okay? What does it mean? And when, you, when I ask that question, I want you to think about this secondary question. Where do I go to know what it means? Okay? So what does it mean? What do I think it means in my natural reasoning? And then where would I go to figure out what it could mean? Okay? Ready, set, three minutes. Go. Same, same verses. We're going to just go ham on verse five verses and see what we can find. Okay, what does it mean? What are some things that came up in you guys' conversations? What does it mean? In the very back, those two lovely ladies, what does it mean? We have a pastor's kid back there. I know she knows something. No pressure. Hebrew word. Yeah, what does it mean? It's an explanation of creation. Love it. Someone else. There's no wrong answers, friends. We're all learning. We're all open, remember? That's interesting. can judge man so so he can give identity and he really has an identity right like a judge it's interesting gives value So there's some sort of pre-existence of all of this that's happening. 
procrastinating. What else? Something else. That group in the back. Those four. Yeah, yeah, we're jumping down like quite a few steps though. Yeah, and so, and I think, I honestly, I think you're awesome for saying that, by the way, because most other people in here are trying to get there too, okay? This is often how we all read the Bible. Why? Because we want to know what to do, right? We want to respond. Like, it's, it's, it's normal, it's superhuman to do that. I think lingering in our questions is really important as we're reading the Bible. Because guess what? We're already starting to make assumptions. You hear what I'm saying? So, like, can I just give you a simple example? That, again, I'm reading it, I'm thinking about it again. I'm going, oh, yeah, there's actually no punctuation in Hebrew? Oh, shoot. What does that mean? So, in the beginning, God? I'm just asking the question, like, oh, wait, the... Darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God. So I'm like, oh, is, was the darkness over both the face of the deep and the spirit of God? I, I'm just, I'm encouraging us to ask more questions. Now, all you have to do, a little research, helps begin to answer some of these things. So for instance, one of the things that I wrote down is, if we start having questions about the first five verses, then the most natural thing we can do when we're trying to figure out what does it mean is keep reading. It's the biggest thing I can tell you. Keep reading. Because it, everything else that's around it matters. If we had things before it, that wouldn't matter. If we have things after it, it matters. The questions that we have, I love the question about time. It's amazing. There's a whole conversation about time and I'm a super nerd, so just these things I know. But, but there's this word for day, yom. And some people translate it as one 24-hour day. And some people translate it as like one epic, long, many hours and or days. So did God create in six literal days? Some say yes. There are a whole lot of people who say no. Because it's... A thousand. I mean, that's, that's a great question. That's a great expression to say, well, maybe one day is a thousand. So does he, did he create the world in 6,000 years? I don't know. I, I'm not here to make that judgment. And guess what? That also doesn't change our salvation, just for the record. If you want to believe six days, I'm here for you. If you're not, I'm here for you. Because I genuinely believe that if we're getting hung up like that, we're missing the big point. Which the next question is generalization. What is the big point? Not just one of our questions of what does it mean, but what is the big, what's the bigger idea? And I think we started to get there. People were already running there because we just love to run fast to the point. We're very American in that way, very Western. We want to get to the point. Don't string me along. No, no, no. Be strung along by the Bible. Because really, we could, we could stop at any moment, <laughs> at any word, and unpack it, unpack it, unpack. Or ask more questions about what, heavens and earth. What, what's the difference? No. Well, we don't know that. Right. Right. <laughs> the, so moving to that next question is generalization. And, and here's, here's the thing that I'll tell you about interpretation. This is always the pathway for interpretation. Number one, if, if you're trying to interpret something, you have to read everything around it. Like, keep reading. And then you have to read the whole book that it's in. 
okay? Which I know, this sounds cumbersome, but this is, if you want to interpret something, this is the pathway. So that you can find out every single time the word created shows up in Genesis, what does that, what happens? What is that telling us? What is that revealing? Oh, wait, what does it say? What happens when it's not just in one book, but now we put it in like three books of the Bible? Or all of a sudden, I'm reading Psalm 51, and David says, create in me a clean heart, O Lord. How is that moment for him, him reckoning back to this? Because it's a narrative, right? So everything that's introduced at the beginning continues in the story. We don't read the Bible this way. We, we kind of read it like pieces. We just grab and take, you know. It's kind of like a buffet instead of a compiled dish that's all intentional. And it's all telling us all a whole lot more than we're knowing because we don't know the book. That's the big part for all of us. I mean, there's so many things that we can unpack. But generalization, what is the big idea? I think that we've kind of highlighted it. We've kind of engaged it. Um, that there is a creation of the world. <laughs> there, there was a creation of the world. We might not know every detail about it. We might not know every facet about it. But there was a creation of this world that we are in. And that's fascinating to ask yourself, what is that? I love to think about, if you're trying to figure out what, what the generalization for the whole thing is, is asking the question of how can I summarize everything? Can I write one sentence that tells me what I just read? And then how, again, the generalization is how is it then connected to the bigger picture of the whole Bible? If you go to Revelation and you read about the heavens and the earth, what's going on there at the end of the book? You know, and it's not necessarily chronological, but that's the, the way it's set up. So we need to read it the way it's set up and ask questions about it. And then, like our friend said, the application, and this is such a good, this is just such a generalization. What's the big picture? And then for application, what the question that we're asking, because I don't want us to jump too far into implementation, is what is the difference that it makes? Or what difference does it make? And I want you to think about it. These are the differences that, that I want you to think about. What difference does it make between me and God? What difference does this passage make for me with somebody else here in this room? What difference does it make about me and all of creation? That's the beginning of our application, of recognizing what difference happens when I read this. So I've just been reflecting. I'm like, okay, the big picture of God's creator. God has a face. He's clearly looking, you know. So I'm like, the difference is that if God doesn't have a face, that changes the game for me. Because then when I look at him, what is he, a big blob, a big amorphous entity? Do you see what I'm saying? It immediately says that our God is not personal. That makes a big difference. He cannot be seen, you know, because he doesn't have eyes. I can't look into his eyes. I can't, I can't hear him. That, oof, that would be a huge difference. Because if he says something, you know, his mouth, so I'm assuming he has eyes and a mouth. I hope he doesn't just have eyes and a mouth and a little cyclopsy energy. But I'm beginning to think he has to have a tongue because he's speaking words, you know. I'm just like going there where it's like, what difference does it make? Now listen, I know that we are, we are fast-paced, efficiency kings and queens in this region. We just want to get there quick. But that is not how we read this. It's like slower is actually faster. Because in our slowing down, we realize everything is going. I always think about slower is faster. 
is that when, when you see like a wheel spinning really, really, really fast, it all of a sudden like starts slowing down. You guys know that, that experience, you ever looked at the tire and it's, going, and it, it's like do, 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 and you feel like you're in the matrix. That's, that's actually what happens in scripture when you slow down because there's so much activity happening here. It's, it's actually super fast. I mean, guys, we're talking about in just a little bit of time, whatever that time is, in a little bit of time, a lot has happened. Somehow, the creator God has dealt with void and darkness in one verse. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, what happened? Was there a big, epic, God's trying to create void and darkness, cosmic clash? I, I'm just saying, like, it's so fast that we got to slow it down. Oh, and the spirit was hovering over the face. So the whole time, we got like this creator God and the spirit of the creator God. And they're, I'm like, oh, now we got like tag team, you know, back again. And I'm like, there's something that happens when we begin to slow it down. That when we're Christians, we've been in church, we heard this. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was formed. We just, we, we miss it. We lose it. And so people are always like, Jason, how do you notice these things in the text? I'm like, I just slow down. I, just, I stop rushing. Where, where am I trying to get to? What's the point? Like, am I, I just want to get to the end of the book. <laughs> That's a long one. You're going to be there for a lot of hours. You know what I'm saying? But if we slow down, we might be present, which is the key to reading any good book or the most important book of all time, is to be present with the present God in the book. And so I think for us, we got to slow down. So application, the, the question is, is what, what difference does it make? Well, I'm excited that whoever this God is, that get, I'm, I'm saying this because we're just reading this, we don't really know a whole lot about this God except he created. He has somehow dealt with darkness and he has dealt with void and he and he has he's not only done that, but he's actually put delineation between things that maybe seem bad to us. I mean, here's another question that I have for all of us wonderful people. Like, he, he actually he doesn't hate darkness. Yikes. Yikes. See, we jump way later in the book and we're like, oh darkness. And I'm like, whoa, 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 what darkness? This one? That he, that he saw and he separated it and he called it and then he's like, oh, this is a day. He named it night. I'm just asking those questions to disrupt you because the book disrupts us if we let it. Last section, implementation. I literally wrote down what disrupts me. <laughs> But, but the better question is, is what must I change? What must I change? And I think that the reason why that is, is such a powerful question in the implementation of what should I change, it, it goes back to what Candace was saying. You know, all of a sudden, I, I'm like, there's this time thing. And then somebody else uh, that um, Amy's group was talking about, you know, there's this rhythm and so then my question is, is like, is this all trying to teach us a different rhythm on how to live? Are we, are we, I, I think one of the things I love is that, you know, God said something and, and then he saw it. You know, I'm like, so how many things are you saying, but then, then are you actually reflecting on what you've said? You know, is that a rhythm that we need? Uh, let's go back for, are we creative people? He is. Do we create? Do we ever come to the point where we judge in this wonderful book? Do we name things? What's the ramification of me naming something? What if I name something poorly? changes everything. And so I hope that we can just come to this place where we're asking like, what can I do? Or what do I need to be curious about in this implementation? If, if I'm going to think about what must I change? 
maybe there's not enough here for me. I need to read some more. I gave you a whole page. You can read some more. And you, and you read, and, you, and then all of a sudden you get to six, and, and God said, hmm, and seven. Oh, he made, huh. Oh, and he separated, huh. Oh, and God said again, and then he saw, and then he said, and he saw, as our friends talked about. Oh, and then he saw it was good, and then he saw it was good, and he saw it was good, and he saw that it was good, and it happens again and again and again. And the question is, is like, have I come to the place where I can see so well that I can see the good? That's a question of implementation. Have I looked long enough? At first glance, didn't see anything good. Second glance, didn't see anything. How about the sixth glance? You know, we, we get that later in the story that he finally says something's not good. You know what he says? It is not good that humans should be alone. Wow. Changes the game. Because that means that everything else is good because it's together. Ooh, what's not together in my life? I, I'm just, I know that this seems annoying with the questions, but how do you expect to ever be transformed by it? I, I wanted to, to, if you want to turn your page over, I just want to look real quick, just very briefly. I guess at the, the end of the day, I just want to show you that this is basically my process. <laughs> like, I do a lot of this, and this is a lot of what happens. And then a lot of times I go back to Lectio, and I read it, and I meditate, and then I pray it, and then I think about an action. Like, I, I combo these things. I'm going to tell you about something that I just started um, doing that I've, I'm actually going to challenge you to do. But before we do that... I want you to read verse 27 in your group together. And I just want you to just note anything of consequence in verse 27. And if you notice something or you, you are like surprised by something or if it hits any of the observation, interpretation, generalization, any of these things, I, I just want you to offer it up for all of us as we read verse 27. Anybody want to throw something out there? You can, you can know from what he did back to him, mm. but you may not know what he's like, but you know what he's really like. That's right. And so you can reverse engineer it. Okay. Come up with something. It's, I love it. There's that money's talking about from this verse, can I reverse engineer some stuff about myself and think about how it might be like God if I'm made in his image? So maybe some things, yes. Maybe some things, no. But we don't know yet. We don't have the rest of the story. We're only on verse 27. So yes. It says a lot. It does say a lot. It says a lot. And I think that the atheists would read these verses, the ones you put up on the board, and somehow Okay. The question is: Is can are we are we coming to it like being open enough to let it speak to us? You right. know, twenty-seven. Somebody, anybody. That's right. He said it in two different phrases. I love that. What's a, what's something else that is in there? I have no agenda, by the way. I'm just asking us to look at another verse. Just. That's a familiar verse. That's, that's why. Male and female. Cool. Awesome. What else? I love that. 
you know, one of the biggest cues for us when we're reading the Bible is repetition. Um, the cultural pathway for the Hebrew people is always one of severe repetition. They love parallelisms. They love to repeat themselves. It's all for the purposes of getting it into our memory, to getting it into our existence, like we talked a little bit last week. I, I love that. I mean, I think... You know, I think that as, as I was reading through it today, I was just, I know it seems silly, but I was struck that it, it, it's the movement from him to them. Like something about that for me today was just really beautiful to think about. That we're not just talking about one human. We're talking about just the expansion of all humans. That somehow I end up in that them. I end up a created being somewhere in this story. I am a them in this. And so just like, just really wanting us in this season, and you know, like I said, I didn't, I didn't bring a bunch of fancy things to teach you all tonight. Just wanted us to kind of get in it together, see that it doesn't have to be crazy. Honestly, doing it with other people is the most transformative way you can do it. The Bible has always been intended to be read in groups, always. Like, go back in history and read. They always read together, almost never read by themselves. We're used to that. We privatize in America. We're personalized. You know, we're, but, but we're forgetting that it is actually in all of our pieces that we can see a much bigger, much better picture than we can alone. And, and as I was thinking and, and, and chewing through that, I'm just like, hey, let me give you a little example of something you can do if you're brave enough. <laughs> so I've told a few people about this, but I felt like I needed to reiterate it again tonight. Um, I am, uh, there was a guy in the church, and he was like, hey, man, um, I really want to grow in my relationship with God. I want to become more like him. What, what do I do? And I, I knew that in my whole journey, it was always the Bible. Like, that was always the biggest pathway of growth and change that I ever experienced. And so I said, well, why don't we just read the Bible together? It's really simple. Hey, you want to read the Bible together? Um, we started in Song of Songs of all books. Such a strange place to start, but it's where we started. And we, we made a little decision that we were going to both read the same thing the same day. And then we were going to sit down and reflect on it. <laughs> Um, my old mentor used to say, there is no transformation without reflection. Um, so if you feel like your life has not been changing, it's probably because you're not reflecting on it enough. And we would reflect on these verses, and we decided we were going to write 250 words or a small paragraph every day based on one verse in the one chapter a day that we read. And then from that one verse, we were going to write our 250 words or a small paragraph, and then we were going to write one prayer based on that. And we were going to ask all these kinds of questions. What does this mean? How does it disrupt me? Maybe sometimes it's my prayer that highlights one of the ways that I'm opening this thing up. And, and um, we are on 351 days since. And it has most dramatically shifted things in my heart because I've never done anything like this with someone else for so long. And I've, I'm realizing now that as we're talking, we're forming each other. <laughs> because all the things he sees, I don't see. All the things he's praying are not necessarily the things I pray. And then other days, we're writing the exact same thing about the same verse that we both specifically picked from one chapter. And we're like, oh man, that was wild. You know, or all of a sudden it's like we wrote on the same verse, you know, but it's all so different, so many different things. And it has given me such an appreciation for reading the Bible together. And guess what? We got so good and eased by it. We we're like, one chapter is not enough. So we went to two. We're like, mm -mm. then we got crazy in July. We read five Psalms in one chapter. So we were doing six chapters. 
Now we've turned it down a little bit. We're back to three chapters in the New Testament, one chapter in the Old Testament. And I'm just, I want to admonish, I want to encourage you to try it out. And then, of course, I'm texting him my little mini response to the Bible. And he's texting me back. Very simple. Normally, we read one in the morning and then the other one sent at night, you know, kind of a morning and evening thing. But I, listen, do it with your spouse. Do it with your best friend. If you want somebody to do it and you can't find anybody, I'll do it with you. You have to read four chapters a day, but I'll do it with you. Because I'm, I so believe in this season that there's an invitation for us to be shaped and formed by the Bible, by praying the Bible, by reading the Bible, by reading it over and over again, by reading it with each other, by observing and interpreting and generalizing and applying and implementing that maybe, just maybe, we might all come out looking like him. If it's all about him, and my whole life is about reading and engaging with him, then maybe I don't have to do more. Maybe I need to be open to all the more that's there. So, with that, I'm done, and I'm going to pray for you. And if you have any questions, comments, snide remarks, I will take all of them. Um, if you don't like the way we taught the Bible, you can come next week and Cassie will give you a different version. And you can come and hear Pastor Alvin, which that's going to be a ride. Um, <laughs> he's a wild guy, you know. Um, but I, I just, I, I want to just tell you that, listen, if you, if you need resources as well, when you're trying to interpret, when you're trying to understand things, um, the pastors here are always willing to take your questions. They really are. If you send us an email, send us a text, I'll set up an appointment. I, I'm setting up an appointment with, with someone right now. We're literally walking through the Gospels, and they're asking every question that they want to ask. And I'm just, our Bibles are open, and we're just talking. Because I just, I really do believe it's what God's inviting our community into in this season. So, let me pray for you all. Jesus, we just thank you for all these beautiful humans that are here tonight. Lord, we just ask that they would see your face in the book. Um, Lord, I pray that uh, when we hear that it's all about you, I hope we don't just get into it as some sort of like dis just mere words, but I pray that we would actually experience who you are. Lord, I pray that um, you would open the eyes of our hearts and you would open our ears to receive Lord, whatever we need that day, teaching, correction, instruction, and righteousness, um, Lord, that we would just be so open to what you might be trying to invite us into in this wonderful season that you have us in. Lord, I pray that we would learn to love the Bible, that we would love the Bible because you love the Bible, and you quoted from it all the time, and your people have quoted from it for thousands of years, and so I pray that we would find ourselves in that number that love the book that's all about you. In Jesus' name, amen.